Hello class, this is Miss Augustine, and today we are going to continue with chapter 12. And today, this is part two, we're going to talk about solubility and solubility curves. So, first of all, we need to talk a little bit about solute-solvent interactions. Why does salt dissolve in water, but for instance, iodine doesn't? Why does oil not mix in water? Why does iodine dissolve in alcohol, but salt doesn't? And again, we can think about mixtures like salad dressing here. So what determines what happens when a solute encounters a solvent is something we refer to as like dissolves like. So polar solutes will dissolve in polar solvents. So for instance, your sodium chloride, which is polar, Thionic will dissolve in water, which is also polar. And nonpolar things will dissolve in nonpolar things. So for instance, iodine, remember, is a diatomic molecule. It's going to be very, very nonpolar, and it's molecular. So it does not like to dissolve in water, but it will dissolve in something like oil, which is nonpolar. So water is polar, so only polar substances will dissolve well in it. Salt is polar, and again, salt dissolves in water. Oil is nonpolar, so it floats on water because it's less dense, um, and it won't combine with it. So the polarity of water, here's two pictures. Remember that water is molecular, so these are covalent bonds, and that because water contains oxygen, which is very electronegative, and hydrogen, which is much less so. The electrons spend more of their time on oxygen and less on hydrogen. This is another example here. So what we're seeing is that there's a slight negative charge on the oxygen side and a slight positive side uh, where the hydrogens are. And so we can think about the dissolving properties of water and how if you're trying to dissolve sodium chloride, water is going to align itself so that the positive hydrogens are near the negative chlorides and the um, negative oxygen side is going to be uh, attracted to the sodium. So here you'll see that a chloride is surrounded by waters with the hydrogen side facing and the sodium is surrounded by waters with the oxygen side phasing. So again, you need that interaction between the solute and the solvent to pull the solute into solution. So what we'd like to look at next is something called the solubility curve. Here comes. So this is the solubility curve, and what we're looking at here is uh, the amount of salts, these are all salts, that can be dissolved per 100 grams of water. So grams of salt and 100 grams of water. So everything from zero to 100 grams of salt. And this is as a function of temperature. So if we look, for instance, at um, potassium nitrate, at zero degrees C, we can dissolve 10 grams of potassium nitrate and 100 grams of water. If we go to 50 degrees C, now I can dissolve 85 grams, actually 87 grams of potassium nitrate. So what this is showing is that for most of these salts, the solubility increases as the temperature increases, with a few exceptions. Here, cerium, what is that, cerium-3 sulfate um, actually decreases in solubility. So what do these curves actually mean? Well, the line or curve tells you what the maximum amount of a solute that you can dissolve at a given temperature for a given amount of solvent. So let's do some definitions. So what the solubility curve shows you is the line represents the maximum amount of a solute that can be dissolved in a specific amount of solvent at a given temperature. Very specific definition. So anywhere along the line on that graph represents the maximum amount of solute that you can dissolve in 100 grams of solvent at a particular temperature. So what about less than that? So an unsaturated solution has less than the maximum amount of solute 
dissolved in a specific amount of solvent at a given temperature. So again, anywhere below the line on the graph represents an unsaturated solution. And continuing along, what about a supersaturated solution? That would be more than the maximum amount of solute that can be dissolved in a given amount of solvent at a given temperature. In order to do this, you usually would have to increase the temperature of the solvent. And again, supersaturated represents above the line. So here is an example. I hope all of you have made rock candy at some point in your lives. So how do you do that? In order to make a supersaturated solution, you take more solvent, more, excuse me, solute than can be dissolved in a solvent at a given temperature, and you heat it up. And when you heat it, you can get more to go in. So then what happens is you let it cool. And in this case with rock candy, if you were to put a string in it, the crystals would form on that string, or if you put a stick in it or whatever. So what you're really doing is you're taking advantage of the increase in solubility as the temperature of the solvent increases. So I wanted to look back at this curve for a minute and revisit that. So let's say I was working with potassium chloride, KCl, right here, this dark blue line. If I dissolved 90, uh, 55 grams at 90 degrees C, so I took 55 grams of potassium chloride, put it in 100 grams, which is the same as 100 mils of water, it would fall to the bottom. So I heat it up to about 90 degrees C, and I get it to all dissolve. Now, as I gently cool that solution, and I'm here, remember I put in 55 grams, well now I am above the curve. So at 90 degrees C, that would be a saturated solution. But if I cool it, now I have a super saturated solution. And if I were to keep letting it cool to room temperature, which would be like 25 degrees C, you could see that I would be quite a bit above my curve. So that means that I have dissolved way more than you could put at, say, 25 degrees C. Why do we care about this? Well, if you're making rock candy, it's useful with sugar. Um, but anytime you're purifying anything that you make in the lab that is a salt, for instance, you want to get out impurities. So what you do is you will dissolve it in a solvent that's appropriate, and then you'll make a super saturated solution and you'll gently cool it. And then the crystals will fall out kind of like a snow globe and you can filter those and collect them and leave the impurities behind in your solvent. So now I wanted to talk a little bit about trends in solubility. In general, as our curve showed us, the uh, solubility of solids in liquids in general increases as the temperature increases. So the particles are more energetic, they can move more quickly, and again, there's more collisions. Gases, however, decrease in solubility as the temperature increases. So it's the opposite effect. So again, gas particles have so much energy as the temperature increases, they tend to move out of solution. So for gases um, dissolved in a liquid, you'll see that the solubility, for instance, of methane or oxygen, let's look at oxygen, you're almost at two um, millimoles per uh, liter of solution here. And as the temperature increases, my solubility drops down to one. So we lose about half of the solubility. So that begs the question, why do fish die in warm water? Well, in warm weather, the temperature of the water increases, and so the dissolved oxygen decreases in solubility, and more fish can die. It's kind of sad. So how about liquid solutes and solvents? So when you're talking about a liquid-liquid, uh, solute and solvent are both liquid, we talk about whether something is immiscible, liquids that are not soluble in each other, like oil and water, and miscible liquids, liquids that do dissolve freely in one another in any proportion. And an example of that would be 
um, isopropyl alcohol. The rubbing alcohol that's in your medicine cabinet is isopropyl in water, and it's only about a 25% solution of isopropyl in water. So they are very miscible. So these are two examples of immiscible liquids where oil and vinegar don't mix, and then this is three different liquids, and again, they're um, aligned by their density, but again, they are not soluble in one another. So they are said to be immiscible. So what about pressure? Changes in pressure tend to have very little effect on the solubilities of liquids or solids um, in liquid solvents. So pressure increases the solubility of a gas in a liquid, so it has an effect. Um, so if you're trying to change the solubility of a solid in a liquid, changing the pressure is not going to do anything. However, if you're trying to change the solubility of a gas in a liquid, if you increase the pressure of the gas over the liquid, it will increase the solubility of the gas in that liquid. And it's called Henry's Law. There's an equation. We're not going to use it, um, but there's an equation that goes with it. And I have a little picture. So here, if you're trying to increase the solubility of a gas in a liquid, you can increase the pressure of that gas over the liquid, and that forces more gas uh, particles or molecules into the liquid. And again, that's kind of how they keep the bubbles in soda. So they pressurize the liquid um, with gas above it, and that keeps your carbon dioxide in solution. Last thing we talk about is molar heats of solution. We're not going to get into it very much, but the delta H for a solution is the amount of heat energy that's either absorbed or released when a mole of a solute dissolves in a specific amount of a solvent. And if it is endothermic with a positive heat of solution, it'll feel cold when you mix them together. That would be my example of tang in water, that it gets cold. And if it's something like sodium hydroxide in water, it gets very hot. And again, it gives off heat. It's exothermic. So um, my last examples here are hot and cold packs. So instant cold packs are endothermic. They take advantage of ammonium nitrate, excuse me, ammonium nitrate dissolving in water, and it absorbs energy, so it gets cold. And my last example is an exothermic hot pack that takes advantage of either calcium chloride or magnesium sulfate, and they release energy when they dissolve, and that's how warm packs work. This is Ms. Augustine signing off.